All right, everybody, welcome back to the main stage here at the Boston Marathon Expo. We hope you're having a great day so far. We are joined uh, now by a panel of elite and professional athletes here from the BAA High Performance Team. We're going to talk about race preparations for success, making sure that you've got the know-how and some last-minute tips and tricks for you to run the best possible virtual Boston Marathon this week. And we thank you for joining us. Joining us here today are professional runner, runners, Erica Kemp. Erica, give us a wave. Elena Tab, who's in a car somewhere. Elena, thank you. Uh, we've got Gerald Mock and Jacob Thompson, roommates, gentlemen. And we've got the director, BAA director of athletic programs, Wayne Levy. He's in the same traffic jam Elena is. Hi, Wayne. And we've got uh, BAA head coach Mark Carroll with us. And uh, today, these six fine folks will help provide guidance and suggestions for runners preparing to tackle the 26.2 mile distance. Um, guys, our first topic, ladies and gentlemen, our first topic is designing a great course for your solo race. We have some runners who may have already run their race, but, but many who have not. Uh, and there are some tips and tricks for designing a course that will work best for you. And Wayne, why don't we start with you? Um, what are some tips you'd want to share with, with the runners out there? So first, TK, uh, thanks for having us. I'm really excited to be here. Um, there are some challenges with um, having a participate in a virtual uh, road race, in this case, a virtual marathon, but there are also some benefits. Um, one of the benefits is you get to be your own race director, right? If you are participating in the normal Boston Marathon, you know the course, one of the chal most challenging. Uh, the day is set, the time is set, and you kind of pray and hope that the weather uh, cooperates. Uh, in this particular case where you have a window, you get to be your own race director. So you get to pick what day you want to run, you get to pick what time you want to run, and you get to pick what course you want to run. And um, there are some benefits that come with that. If you have not already picked your course or participate um, by running, then you get to be strategic about picking a course that allows you to access fluids, really important. So maybe you want to pick a loop course so you can uh, do it several times and access your fluids, your water, your Gatorade, and your cliff uh, shot. So um, that's a benefit. Restrooms. Uh, you may want to think about that as you're selecting your, your course and what kind of support you're going to need or have, whether it's your family out there or friends cheering you on. Um, be strategic about selecting a course that will allow you to access all of those things. And then the last thing you want to keep in mind is um, really try to select a course that's going to have minimum traffic. And when I say traffic, I'm not talking about just cars, but also bike traffic, runners, walkers. Um, you're still doing this in the middle of a pandemic. And if you can select a course that has minimum traffic, um, you're going to have a great experience. So those are just some um, quick thoughts that come to mind. I'm sure uh, the rest of the panelists will have others as well. Yeah, thank you, Wayne. And there's, there's uh, the support system I, I feel is not only good for encouragement, but in speaking with medical coordinator Chris Troianos this week, it's also about like folks can, who can keep an eye on you after the race or during the race when you might be quite depleted on certain things to like help you out if, if, if you need it. Um, Mark, you've done, you've done a, a marathon or two over, over time. What, what uh, suggestions might you have? Anything about topography or something, that, tips or tricks that might, be, uh, might play into a home course advantage? Um, well, I guess if you want to run fast, you want to pick a fairly flat course. <laughs> so um, if time is what you're after, if you want to mimic the Boston Marathon course, then you're going to have to find a course that's a bit more challenging, especially with hills in the latter stages. Um, I think Wayne hit on a few very important points here. Um, you know, a big city marathon, the roads are closed, and I think it's important to have the minimum amount of traffic and bicycles. Um, on the course just for safety reasons um, my preference would be a loop course in a park or you know if you happen to be in Boston the Charles River obviously has some circuits that are uninterrupted but wherever you are I, I think finding a course that's safe um, as Wayne alluded to uh, where you can put out bottles or have friends or family hand you your bottles 
I think these are the important uh, things and um, staying safe, having your drinks, avoiding traffic. And um, if you want to run fast, find a flat one. Yeah, well, that's helpful. And Mark, just to back up a little bit, uh, as the head, you are the head coach of uh, the BAA high performance team. You yourself were a specialist, I think, in the 3,000 and 5,000 meters. Uh, I think you represented Ireland for many years and excelled on the European uh, circuit, but, but a few marathons under your belt as well, right? Yeah, that's right. I, I um, Well, I ran uh, New York. I had a good one in New York. That was my first one. Um, and then after that, they didn't go so well, to be honest. <laughs> so um, I had one good experience. I was supposed to do Boston at one point, and I, unfortunately, I got injured, didn't get to do it. So now I hopefully will get to coach athletes to do Boston in, in, in the next couple of years. Good. Well, our next topic is lessons learned. So hold on to that for a, a second. Uh, and Wayne, just some, some background. You've run how many marathons here? Uh, I have done approximately, uh, I'm not going to count the ones that I did not finish, 24, 25 marathons and about 12 or 13 Boston marathons. Mm -hmm. Great, great, great. And Erica, what, what distances are you specializing in for Team BAA? Um, primarily 5K and 10K. Okay. And so as you, uh, you've got a lot of pre-race and in-race tips and guidance, I'm sure that um, we're definitely going to want to tap into but have you ever thought about doing the big 26.2 or or uh, is that off in the in the future i would definitely say it's in the future um the only time i ever think that i might want to do it is sitting at the finish line and just being in the grandstands and watching so many people up close in person and just seeing how like happy and accomplished everyone is it like really makes you but then like the reality of running 26.2 mile sets in and I'm like maybe we'll hold off on another couple of years. Uh, Elena you're probably the most uh, tenured member of the BA high performance team on this panel. Um, what distances are you specializing in these days? Um, so right now 10k to half marathon has kind of been what I focused on um, knowing that the Olympic trials are in June it's kind of 10k focused but then after that I definitely do want to move up and hit the road circuit pretty, pretty well. So I think marathon's probably in my near future. Okay, good. Well, we'll, yeah. That, that'll be exciting. And uh, Jacob and Gerald, you guys are roommates. Where are you guys right now? And, and what events are, are you um, specializing in? Gerald, we'll start with you. Yeah, uh, yeah, we're in, we're in Brookline right here right now. Um, I'm specializing in uh, the marathon and myself. So that's, that's what I came here to, to focus on. He's, he's run 210 in the marathon, too. Uh, no big but, deal. Uh, yeah. uh, myself, uh, pretty, you know, it's pretty similar boat here to Elena. Um, you know, through the, through the Olympic trials, uh, 5K, 10K is certainly my, my focus. But then uh, I think after next, next summer, it's definitely uh, things are starting to shift towards, towards the marathon and, you know, hopefully get into uh, to a Boston starting line one day. Good. Good. Well, it'll hopefully be there to welcome you. Gerald, let's go back to you and we're going to go to the next topic here. This one's going to be a little bit of a lightning round called biggest mistake you've made before a race and what you learned from it. Gerald Mock, we're going to start with you. Biggest mistake you've made before a race and what you learned from it. Yeah. Um, honestly, for me, it just, uh, I, I really like having a little caffeine before race, a little coffee. And I think, uh, I think the worst thing I've done is probably just so overdoing it on the coffee, um, you know, starting to drink it too early and, and continuing to drink it and realizing I'm starting to kind of get dehydrated and an upset stomach and, and just overly jittery. You know, by, by the time I was on the line, I could hardly tie my shoes and uh, it just, it just didn't go, didn't end well. <laughs> so what distance? Watch, watch what you're, uh, watch what you're taking in, I guess, and, uh, and don't do anything, you know, new. Yeah. You know, that's not the time to try, try it at, new strength of coffee or a new energy drink or something, you know, stick to what you know, I guess. If you are over caffeinated, what makes it better? Is it just water or time or? <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I don't have the solution there yet. I, I didn't find it that day, unfortunately. <laughs> what, um, what distance were you running that day? Uh, it was a cross country race. Okay. Cool. And, and Jacob, uh, what's the biggest mistake you've made before a race and what have you, what have you learned from it? Yeah, I used to, to eat um, very close to like race time and I would always, uh, you know, 
and finish my races and end up in, in a trash can throwing up. And I was like, man, I'm just running so hard that I'm making myself throw up. And then I just realized, uh, you know, I was eating an hour before I started a race. So now, yeah, now I don't eat. I eat four hours out from, from the start time of a race, and I'm pretty pretty strict on that. Uh, so if I have anything in that four-hour window, it's like so like just a little granola bar or something that'll be easy on the stomach uh, just because I know my stomach gets upset by you know, anywhere close to, to race time. So exactly. that's a mistake I used to make often, and I've kind of figured it out now. Does it differ from distance to distance, or is that just your rule across all? Uh, That's just my rule across all races. Uh, I'm sure with the marathon, though, uh, you know, keeping your, your stores topped off as long as possible, um, you probably want to make sure you have a good nu nu nutrition plan like the day of the race. For, for the track, it's a little bit, a little bit different. You don't need as, as much fuel for, you know, a race that's under, under 30 minutes as you do. That's one that's going to be over two hours. Okay. Wayne Levy, um, biggest mistake you've made yes. and what you've learned from it. Thanks. So I think uh, the, the biggest mistake that I've made, um, I'm sure others on this panel and others have made as well. And um, you can make this mistake for any distance, but in my case, it was with the marathon. So you, you prepare for a, a race or a marathon, you have your uh, plan A, and my mistake was going into the race and regardless of the weather, trying to stick to my plan A. So um, that was a mistake. And the lesson there is you got to have a plan B and a plan C and be honest with yourself and be willing to adjust accordingly if you need to. But your plan A was so good. Yeah, yeah, which is great. But sometimes you got to be flexible and, um, you know, you have to eat your humble pie and just shift your goals accordingly. Elena, how's your shoulder doing and holding up the phone? Is it okay? It's all right. So what's, <laughs> the biggest arm mistake, <laughs> what's the biggest mistake you've made uh, going into a race and what did you learn from it? I remember in high school, I somehow my coach had my spikes and I'm like lining up for the race, needing my shoes to race. And so at that point, I promised myself, okay, make sure I am prepared and I'm in total control of my things so that I know where everything is. I have a plan set um, because it helps you, especially if it's an early morning race, it helps to have everything planned out and ready to go the night before so that you can sleep better the night before and everything, you're not worrying. So yeah, mine is just feeling prepared and then I can be more relaxed. That's great. And, and Erica, how about for you? Um, I would say I have two, one that I don't make anymore and one that I make constantly. The one that I don't make anymore is kind of the opposite of Jacob as far as just not fueling enough before a race, especially once I finish college and move to the roads with these like super early start times. Like when your start time is at 7, 7.30 a.m. or like for the marathon when people are on buses at like 5, 6 a.m., and maybe they didn't eat breakfast beforehand and then you go out and try and run like a long distance race without enough fuel in the tank and you start to feel faint and weak and even though you train so hard you're not doing as well and you're like what did I do wrong I'm hydrated and it's like yes but you have no fuel in your body so even if I have to wake up at 5 a.m which getting up before six for me is like a nightmare but you got to do what you got to do to stay healthy and be prepared on that start line and then the second one is don't try a new pair of shoes on race day. I still like to take them out of the box and slip them on the day of the race, which I would not recommend because you always end up with blisters. Um, so yeah, I mean, like find your favorite shoes and make sure you've worn them a couple of times before you race in them. All right, Mark, lessons learned. Biggest mistake you've made before a race and what you learned from it. Um, well, the biggest mistake I made was going into the race without a clear plan. And one year I was running London and the, the decision I made before the race was I was just going to go with whatever happened. And I did that. I went out real fast through 10 miles and through the half marathon. And I felt absolutely fantastic at halfway. And then at 20 miles, I learned what the wall was all about. And I'd heard about it, but I felt it. And at 21 miles, I, I literally could not pick my legs up off the ground. I could just about walk back to the hotel. So the mistake I made there was I didn't have my plan. I didn't stick to any sort of plan. I just went with it. And, uh, and I learned the hard way that 
you know, you, you have to have a plan. You just have to have a plan when it comes to the marathon because it's so long an event that if you go too hard, you will pay dearly. And as the saying goes, the race, stop, the race does stop at about 20 miles. Yeah. Yeah. And it, as Wayne said, sometimes have plan A, plan B, plan C, because you don't know what race day might bring. You know, I guess what's different this year is that race day, you, you may, runners may have some flexibility in when race day is, if their schedule allows it, and they may have some flexibility on what time the race begins, if their schedule allows it. Let's talk about the last 24 hours before the race from a nutrition and wellness standpoint. Mark, what, what are some tips that, that you might share uh, for, for runners w within that last 24 hour period? You probably aren't going to sleep well, right? But like, yeah. what else? What else should they know? Well, stay as relaxed as, as relaxed as possible, TK. Stay off your feet. Um, you know, hydrate fairly well. It's usually good to increase carbohydrate intake a little bit. You know, eat some of your favorite pastas. Um, but the big thing is to conserve and, and get ready for the twenty six point two miles ahead. And and I think we've already touched on just plan what's going to happen the next day. Get your gear ready and just be ready to go. So just relax, watch a movie or something if you can, and, and, and just uh, conserve for what's coming the next day. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Erica, for you, as you gear up for your events, 24 hours, what are some best practices you would share? I would definitely make sure you stretch, um, do all your mobility things, because you might not have enough time the morning of, if it's an early morning start, it, say it's gonna be hot out and you wanna get out the door to beat the heat, definitely make sure you spend some of that chill time the day before just making sure like everything's nice and relaxed and stretched out, you know, do some hip circles, roll, you know, roll out all the joints, just make sure your body is nice and prepared. Cause like you said, you might not sleep so well, but if your body is nice and loose and you don't have any muscle kinks, you're still going to be ready to go. That's great. Elena. Um, I was going to say also choose a start time that you want to get out the door. Um, that'll kind of keep you honest. And um, for me personally, I'm, I'm very excitable. So I have to make sure I'm conserving all my excitement for race day. So if I pick a t start time the day before, I can just relax and do whatever visualizations I want to do to be ready. And then once the time comes the next day, I have as much mental energy as possible. So you mean a time like a 9 a.m. or an 8.30? And then yeah. the morning off of that and you're, you're exactly off of that. Exactly. Yeah. And just like what Mark was saying, conserve both physical and mental energy. Yeah. Yeah. Wayne, I, I'd imagine you've gotten pretty good at this over the years with the races you've run. Um, what, were, what are some tips you'd share? Yeah, I think um, just to add to what has been stated uh, already, I, just to expand on Elena's comment, I think, uh, you know, be smart about how you when you start to prepare for the race mentally and what i mean by that let me expand is if the race if you plan on racing on um sunday morning don't start getting psyched or excited for your race on friday because that's going to impact how you sleep and it's nervous energy and it, it can exhaust you that you don't need to uh expand or waste um just think about other stuff you you've done the training don't overthink things and just relax. And then come Sunday morning, then you start getting excited and you let the adrenaline uh, warm you up. Um, second piece is probably not the best time to finish up uh, the deck that you have started. So stay away from doing anything that's going to uh, exert you, um, cause you to get a sore back. Um, you've really, you've worked really hard for weeks and months. Um, do the projects after you complete your race and you're celebrating. Mm -hmm. um, so just be smart. Um, I know most of what I'm saying is common sense, but sometimes common sense, uh, we forget and, and make those mistakes, even with the simplest of things. Gerald, it sounds like when, for a time like 2.10, it sounds like things clicked into place for you. I, I'm imagining that you, are, you were pleased with a 2.10 performance. I'm also imagining you were pleased with your prep for it in the last 24 hours. What were some things that you did? Yeah. Yeah, um, I think I think for me, you know, focusing just on that last part of that 24 hours, just get it, choosing a time to get up and make sure you're you're plenty alert, especially if you're going to start early. Um, that was a big deal for me, just making sure I was up, you know, a few hours ahead of time, so you have time to 
to get some food down and to use the bathroom a few times and just start feeling awake and alert and, and like yourself when you're running. It's kind of, it's not a good time to be, be running around groggy and tight and stiff. So I think, I think getting up, getting up early, well ahead and, and kind of setting a few things for yourself to do, like, like eating and um, some stretches and stuff then having time to just relax right before you run instead of just getting up and, and getting right at it. Sounds like you found a balance for just the right amount of caffeine to be alert, but not be too <laughs> jumpy. Is that right? Right. Yeah. <laughs> Good. And Jacob, for yourself, uh, again, last 24 hours, what are you doing? Yeah. So the last 24 hours for me is like, it's like my last time to get my, my mind right and get like, get my game plan down. So I like to read over my training logs. I see all the work that, you know, I put in for months and months building up to this race. And that's something I really like to do before, before big races is go back, look at my old training. I come up with, you know, my game plan, kind of like Mark said, you got to have a, a race plan. And I, I have, you know, I have goals for the, the entire race, but also try to divide it up. And I have, I have mid race goals. I know what split I need to hit at this point in the race. I know who I'm trying to compete with at this point in the race. And I really commit to those, you know, the night before and just kind of, you know, see the race over and over in my head. So for me, the, the night before is really about just getting my, you know, reassuring myself, I've done this training, you've done all these good workouts, you put all this work into it, you're capable of doing this. And then like, I decide what the plan is and get ready to execute. That's such a great idea about reading, rereading your training logs. I mean, the saying is, the hay is in the barn, but you're still gonna be nervous. So if you can open up the barn door and look at all the hay, well, that makes you feel better. I, I love that. I, love yeah, I feel like a lot of times runners can like kind of talk themselves out of what they originally had planned on doing, but going back through and like looking at my training and seeing the workouts I put in, like that way I know when I step to the starting line, like I have no second doubts of, you know, maybe I'm not in this good of shape. Maybe I shouldn't be in this position. Uh, it really assures me that like, you know, this is where I am. This is where I want to be. This is what I want to be doing. Yeah. That's great. Elena, you talked about laying out the stuff the night before and being sure that you have everything. Our next topic is called the head to toe uh, checklist. And we've talked about no new shoes and, and no new clothing on, on race day. Uh, Mark Carroll, what am I forgetting in this, in this race day checklist? What are some other things that folks? Um, well, if we go head to toe, possibly a hat. Um, if you're a runner that likes to run with a hat, sunglasses, if it's a sunny day, um, we certainly, you need your uniform that you're going to run in. You need your bib number, which in this particular case, I, I guess the participants will print off themselves. You'll need your pins, uh, your shoes, or products if you wear them. Um, obviously, your GPS watch, fully charged up. Um, that's something important to plug your GPS watch in the day before. Make sure that on race morning, we're not scrambling for charge. Um, we're going to need to be able to submit your results when you're done. So we don't want that GPS watch uh, going, going on the blink with, with five miles to go. Um, uh, sunscreen possibly. And of course, nowadays, your masks. You, you need to have some masks. Um, but wear one, maybe put another one in a, in a baggie. If it, if it gets a lot of sweat on it, you might want to change it halfway is true. Um, but there's some of the important things. And, and of course, your drink bottles, if you plan on having drinks throughout the race. And where are you going to put those bottles or how someone going to hand them to you? So these are all part, important things to have on the checklist the day before and you double check it. I, for me, I used to put everything right by the door so I couldn't leave without anything. I'd have to step over it to get out. So I, I prepare it, maybe not the drinks part, uh, you know, but, but I would have everything ready to go the night before and, and double check it and triple check it before you go on race day. That's great. Yeah. And, and, Wayne, you also mentioned how everyone's their own race director. Did Mark forget anything there, or are there other things that, that you'd want to add? Yeah, no, I think he covered it well. The only thing that I would add is um, think about post-race. So um, what's really going to be important is for you to continue with your hydration. And then if you typically um, get protein into your system after, uh, bring that so you don't have to wait until you get home, depending on where your course is. So think about post-race recovery um, as well. Um, but I think, you know, most of it has been covered. And the, just to add to what has been said, I think that the, I'm thinking back to mistakes that I've heard people make. Don't try anything new within the last 24 hours or on race day. So um, if you prepare during your long runs and you thought about what you would wait 
cup and have for breakfast and just your it, this is those were dress rehearsal and now it's time to execute so now is not the time to try anything new whether you're going to go out for mexican food the night before a race just stick to what you've been doing before uh in your preparation erica the head to toe checklist anything that um we haven't covered yet that you want to make sure you have with you you got a fully charged gps watch and shoes and orthotics and your bib and your pins, but there must be some good luck charm or something that you want to bring with you. I don't know. Um, if you have a good luck charm, definitely bring it. But I would also recommend, especially if someone's going out to do it by themselves and they don't have anyone else on the course with them, then either making sure they have some sort of like the runner ID tags on their watch or bring their phone with them because one of the things with the virtual is that you don't constantly have medical professionals on a closed off course. So you just wanna make sure that you're not out there alone, whether that's doing a loop course, running past your house, or being somewhere where you know there's gonna be rangers if you're at a park, or making sure you have your phone just so you have someone to contact if something does happen. Yeah. Um, and also, sort of unrelated but related to as far as what you're wearing make sure you check the weather and make sure you bring layers because a marathon takes a while it might be 50 degrees at the start and you might be a little cold so you might want to bring a light jacket and then maybe wear a tank top underneath so that as it heats up you can take the jacket off but definitely just double check the weather in case you need some layers yeah, that, that's great. Um, gentlemen, Gerald and, and Jacob, uh, people don't go into races thinking they're going to need Band-Aids or have chafing or have issues along the race course. Have you guys run into any issues over the years and have you like made preparations or, or should runners be thinking of a little first aid kit or something? I, I certainly keep a, a big tub of Aquaphor in my, uh, my training bag at all times. I need to lube up a little bit because chaf yeah, chafing can be can be a big problem. Yeah. yeah, I don't generally carry too much of that stuff. I guess just having, you know, having something on hand at, at your house. Right. And then and then maybe perhaps a, a little bit to bring out with you or something if you're if you're going out far from your home. Elena, um, any any things that we didn't cover for that head to toe checklist for you? Just um with the water, if you're either carrying it or putting it somewhere, add like a cliff gel shot some sort of quick carbohydrate simple carbohydrate because it's a long way and you're going to need some fuel yeah there's no cliff shot zones along your course there's no volunteers oh, passing out games right so, so yeah you got to be prepared be your own race director as we said all right well let's get into race day let's get into the performance the the imaginary gun fires and you start your your real race Elena, what are some tips you'd want to share here for, for whether it's mental performance or, or physically? I mean, as you've undertaken um, 10,000 meters, 10Ks, half marathons, what are some, some things that you've brought with you once, uh, once you're underway? Yeah, I think a lot of times when we're doing a long road race, you think of the monuments you have to get to, you know, the um, Boston College, Boylston, all those things on the marathon course. But if you don't have that, just w whatever your course is, choose something, choose short-term tangible goals to get to and check the box and then move on to the next goal. Like I think it's gonna be really important to not just think about completing the 26.2, but having those check marks along the way so that you can get to the finish line. Yeah, have those sort of- and Whatever that might look like, if that's, if that's things along the course or um, the way you want to feel at mile five versus mile 20, things like that could be based off of feel or it could be um, tangible goals. Could, yeah, could be based off of feel, could be based off of time and performance. Gerald, when you're running a marathon, do you try to check your splits every mile or do you want to feel a certain time? You want to be, how often do you check your time versus your feel to understand what sort of day you're having? Yeah, I think I think early on you'd need to be maybe a little um, a, definitely a combination, I guess. You don't you don't want to be too fixated on time early on because you just have so far to go. And so sometimes being really overly fixated with your with your splits um, can get you down down the wrong track. Um, I think I think it's good, kind of like Elena was saying, having having little goals that you can check just to keep your positive 
momentum going in the right direction and you don't start un unraveling when something doesn't go exactly as planned. So I think in that sense, I, I like to shy, I shy away from looking at early mile splits just because I don't, I don't want to look at the first mile or two and see that I'm slow and, and think the whole thing's ruined, you know, cause you just have so much race left. So I think, I think kind of racing on field there is important for sure. Um, but then just starting conservatively too, uh, again, just because it's so long, um, you know, what my, my marathon I did, I definitely had in mind to start on the conservative side and made sure to run faster in the second half. Um, it's a really hard event to kind of bank time on, you know, you don't run really well early and usually finish strong too. Um, you want to make sure you're saving that towards the end and not, not, uh, going too hard too soon. Yeah. And Jacob, just to add on that, are there, are there some, some guiding principles for race day performance that, that, that you, you found to be successful for yourself? Yeah, certainly. I, I really like to break races up into segments and kind of focus on one, one segment at a time. And also kind of going back to your, you know, your pre-race goals, like, it's nice to have a plan, but like, I think it's like the Mike Tyson quote, like everybody has a plan until they get out there and get punched in the face in the first round. Then, you know, then what do you do? Uh, so I like to have a plan for like, you know, if I know when I'm going to get to a hard part in the course and like every ounce of your body is like, I don't want to take another step. Like that's when you really got to have a plan. Like you got to know what's going to go into your mind as soon as you get to that point. Because if you get there and you suffer for too long, like you just kind of, you kind of give up. So that's really where I started like breaking it breaking it down. Um, I remember back at the, the BA 10K coming down Commonwealth Avenue, I'd gone out really hard with the leaders and I'd kind of gotten dropped off that group and somebody was, was passing me uh, from behind and coming down Com Ave, they have the, the walkways every, or the crosswalks every block and just all the way down, we were coming down the street for, it seemed like the entire race, but I was just, I was just making it to one crosswalk, to one crosswalk, to one crosswalk. And then finally I got to the end of it, turned the corner and there was, there was the finish line. Uh, so just really breaking it down and, you know, having a plan for when, when the race gets tough is, is big. I mean, yes, a marathon is, is a really hard event and uh, no one's ever finished a marathon and been like, wow, that was, that was so easy. It usually takes every ounce of mental and physical strength that you have. Erica, uh, switching to you, you've uh, certainly pushed through difficult uh, moments in races of different distances. What has held you uh, together and, and helped you push through in those times? Yeah, so the longest event I've done so far is the 15K. Um, the first time I did that event back in 2019, I actually won. And that was by far the longest race I had ever run. And it did get very hard because I wasn't used to running for 50 plus minutes. I was used to running for 15. So I think for me, um, like Jacob said, breaking down into smaller pieces. But when it got really hard, I turn to positive self-talk and just telling myself that you've come this far. So I was three, four, five miles deep into a nine and a half mile race. And it's like, well, you've already put all this effort and energy into running a good five miles. Why would you pack it in and just give up and walk it in for the last four? It's like, you've come this far. You just got to push a little further. Like, so I got to five miles and then I could see the 10 K marker. And I was like, okay, like you can run a good 10 K. So then I got to 10K and at that point it was like, well, now I have 5K left and it's like, okay, well, you know how to run a good 5K. So I think like my teammates were saying, just having some tangible smaller goals, but also when it does get really hard, just reminding yourself how far you've already come. And you don't want to just throw all that work away because it got hard because it's a marathon and you know it's going to be hard. So just be prepared for that and remember how far you've already come. You sound like very well coached athletes, Mark. You must be very proud. Mr. Coach, do you have any uh, thing to add or did they say it all for you? Well, they've said a lot of what we would talk about, TK. Um, and I, I think, you know, participants should have some idea of the pace that they're capable of on race day. And, you know, you base that off your training in, you know, the, the, the six weeks or so leading in, you know, your final long runs, workouts should give an indication. So that's your guide. As Wayne said earlier, on race day, things can happen. You might not feel as good. There might be a headwind. So you have to be able to adjust to a plan B or a plan C. And even if it's a perfect day and everything is going okay, just the length of the marathon, you can go through phases where you feel really good and really bad. It's just the marathon. That's just the way it is. Um, unfortunately, in the virtual marathon, unlike the real marathon where you have over 30,000 people around you, 
you know, you can lean on others in the latter stages, especially when it's getting tough. In a lot of cases for the virtual marathon, you're going to be on your own. Um, what I would recommend is having a little playlist there on your, on your phone or, or, or your, your device and, you know, your hype up tunes, you know, or positive tunes that get you through some of those tough miles or, you know, the periods that you're not feeling so good, you know, get the eye of the tiger going or something, you know, whatever you got to do, but, you know, have something or positive thoughts to get you through those tough phases because there nearly always is some tough phases in the marathon. What's the, what's the song, what's the banger you would go to when you were up against the wall, Mark? Because there must be some sort of Irish band we've never heard of. <laughs> <laughs> I've never actually worn music, to be honest. <laughs> All right, but just what's, what's, a, what's a good song? What's, what, what would be your go-to song? Eye of the Tiger? Well, when I was younger and I raced tractors, it was the Rocky, uh, the Rocky soundtrack, the Rocky Four soundtrack that used to get me pumped up. So I'd probably have to go with something like that. All right. Yeah, that, that's, that's, that's timeless. That'll do. Mar Wayne, did we miss anything there in terms of no, just, race day performance? Yeah. You've run great times. Over yeah, no, I think I just want to underscore one important point, and um, a lot of the other panelists have touched on it. And it's, it's pace and pacing. I think that's really important, particularly, you know, doing a marathon is tough uh, for most of our participants. This is going to be their first virtual Boston marathon and it's a different experience. So you have to recognize and accept that before you start. Uh, like coach Carroll said, you don't have the crowd to push you in the latter stages. So your pace that you control is going to dictate how successful you are in this event. Um, so just be, be aware of current fitness and your pace and start off conservatively. It's better to finish strong than to try and put money or time in the bank and then pay for it the last six miles and have a really bad experience. So I just wanna underscore the importance of pacing. I think that's really important uh, for a marathon, particularly a virtual Boston Marathon. But I think, I think we covered most, uh, if not everything. Yeah, great. Our last, uh, our next topic is about the post-race plan. And Wayne, we'll, we'll stick with you. I mean, you certainly want to finish the race in a place that is familiar to you and with people sure. who are familiar to you. Is there any post-race guidance you would share, whether it's nutrition, safety, uh, general wellness? Yeah, so I think just not knowing what the day is going to be like from a temperature standpoint, um, there are some general things that will typically happen when you finish a marathon. In most cases, again, depending on the weather, you may see a decrease in your body temperature. So think about how quickly you can get out of what you're wearing, which um, presumably will be wet. So think of the transition, um, getting out of your wet stuff to put some warmer clothes on so that you're comfortable and try to get your body temperature back up. Um, if it's raining and, and just think about, you know, getting out of your wet stuff as quickly as possible. Um, we touched on the hydration. So even though the race is over, you want to continue with the hydration because that's going to really make a difference in your recovery. Nutrition is also an important part of that, trying to get some protein and some carbs into your system right away. Um, so just put some thought for, for each runner. It's going to be different, but just think through you finish what your needs are going to be and plan accordingly. Mm -hmm. Mark, anything you'd want to add up to that? No, I think Wayne's touched on the initial uh, post-race. Um, what I would say, look, you've worked very hard for a long time for the virtual event. And, you know, once you take care of those initial post-race uh, recoveries, as, as Wayne pointed out, you know, it's time to be proud of your achievement and, you know, take a break and, and go get some ice cream and eat all the things that you, you might have sacrificed over the last few weeks. And, there's time for evaluating the, perfor the performance a week or two or three down the line. And you can look back and make changes. It, this is the first time for a lot of people doing a virtual event. So hopefully for the majority of people, it goes great. And maybe for some, you learn a lot along the way. As you said, you're, you're your own race director now. You're not just a competitor. You're the race director as well. And you learn as you go, but you can, you can figure that stuff out a week or two later. Just, uh, be, uh, be satisfied and be proud of the, what your achievement and, and enjoy yourself for a few weeks and get rested up and recovered for the next one. Gerald, I'd imagine at the end of a 210 marathon, you're pretty depleted and pretty uh, tired, but also pretty happy, I, I would guess. What's a post-race 
thing that you go to either from a celebratory standpoint or a recovery standpoint? Yeah. Um, well, I think like, like, uh, Wayne and Mark said, just continuing to push fluids after, uh, was something that really surprised me. Um, I, you know, I felt like I was more on top of it than, than ever with my fluids when, when I ran the 210 and I was still shocked how, how immediately afterwards I still felt like I was behind. Um, and so I think, I think paying attention to that is, is really good. I, I enjoyed going for, for a little bit of a walk after two. And I know like, you know, a lot of times after that I'm going to be pretty beat up, but just something to just move a little bit. So you're not going straight from finishing a, a marathon to laying on the ground. And I, th I think that, you know, when I've in past races, when I've, when I've done that immediately after a race, I've ended up being a lot sore for a lot longer. So just taking some time to kind of slowly stay loose uh, but as you finish up uh, is, is important too. You, you, if you finish strong running 210, did you hit the, I mean, did you hit the ground for even a second just to like lie down, just to like out of all out exhaustion or did you keep moving? I kept moving. I mean, honestly, it was a, it was a race that really surprised me. So I, I was, I think I had a pretty good adrenaline rush going. Uh, and so I, I, you know, honestly, I, I felt pretty good coming right off the, right off the end of it, but it definitely it caught up with me later at once that adrenaline kind of, kind of wore off. It's like, Oh yeah, now, now I feel it. <laughs> where did you, uh, where did you run that? That was in Chicago. Yeah. Nice. Nice. This past year? Uh, yep. Oh boy. Great. And Jacob, for you, um, post-race, what, what, what are you doing? Um, probably just having a good, a good time with my friends, probably over a couple, a couple drinks uh, that night. It's probably, that's probably my most popular uh, post-race activity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Make sure there's he's really Go ahead, DK, Wade. he's referring to, he said drinks, he's referring to Gatorade and water, just in case you're wondering. <laughs> Correct. It's Gatorade endurance formula with uh, more sodium uh, than, than the traditional Gatorade. Well, that is correct. Uh, yeah. Yeah, is it lemon lime, Jacob? Is that your favorite flavor? Or I do you love, love uh, lemon lime and uh, red. I, I call them just by color, but yeah, yellow and red are probably my two favorite. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's good friends call it fruit punch, but we'll, we'll get to yeah. that. Erica, uh, okay, so you've just run a 3,000 or 5,000 or something and you're so tired, but then you recover. I mean, that 15K must have seemed like an eternity. What are some post-race uh, tips or favorites that you'd want to share? I think the biggest one I've learned is to plan having your breakfast and fluids and everything mapped out, but I've found it to be super important for myself to plan out what I'm going to do after or at least giving myself a timeline because you get really caught up after a race, especially like if you do well, you want to go celebrate or maybe you have stuff to do and you want to hang out with people. Or if you had a bad race, you just want to like go to bed, which is totally understandable, but you need to eat within a certain amount of time. So having that meal ready, or at least knowing where you're going to go, I think especially after a longer race, you don't realize how depleted your body is and you really need to just make sure you pick a time and set aside a window to make sure you're getting that recovery. Elena, after you do your first marathon, who are the first three people you want to see? Oh, man. <laughs> okay. Um, definitely my husband, Brian. Um, and then my coach, for sure, Mark. I want to I wanna be celebrating that it went so well. And then third... You know, I'm going to say my mom because she'll always come and like bring me Reese's, something that makes you feel so sick after. And she never knows what I really want at the time, which is usually just water or nothing. So her, um, her heart is in the right place and she wants to take care of me. So probably her. <laughs> I find, I, I, Wayne, I don't know if you find it, but I have trouble like eating right away after the race. Like yeah. sometimes it takes a little while for the appetite to come uh absolutely yeah. so that's that's common right absolutely your stomach is unsettled um from running 26 um with you know war pollen springs water gatorade and cliff shot so it takes a while but important to even though it, it feels unsettled to still get some sodium into your system um for me it's you know gatorade and potato chips and i do that for a little while until my stomach starts to feel better um i, I think tk i just want to um touch on one thing you know runners are competitive and we all want to do our best but i think it's important to keep things in perspective um we have been preparing for this in the middle of a pandemic 
So um, what does that mean? Uh, you know, maybe you're not going to run your best time. So I think it's just we have to pause, reflect, and be thankful that we're still um, healthy enough to compete and run and, uh, and have fun with it and celebrate our accomplishment. We get so caught up into having a goal and having a time that we forget to celebrate our successes. So I think post-race, we got to just pause and say, you know what? Um, I feel good about my performance. Give yourself a pat on the back. Sometimes we forget to do that. And I think it's important to, to celebrate, uh, even if you didn't get your A goal, just to celebrate our accomplishment. Yeah, and no one's ever run a Boston Marathon in September. Uh, and we're doing it because right. these times are crazy. And that's very, very well said, Wayne. So, so thank you. Um, last question, we're just about out of time. So we're gonna go around quickly. Uh, I'll give everyone about 30 to 40 seconds each to go through their quick best Boston Marathon memory. I know, Erica, you said while sitting in the stands, it's certainly, you start to get the bug a little bit. What's your best Boston Marathon memory? Uh, my best Boston Marathon memory would have to be um, that first one we watched, uh, Mika, or I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing his name wrong, Micah, the Marine who was running for his friends and collapsed like 20 to 30 meters before the finish. And we were sitting front row in the grandstands while he was crawling on his hands and knees to finish. And we didn't understand at the time what his backstory was, but you could tell that that moment meant a lot. And then later on finding out that he was running it for his fallen comrades and it just becoming such a huge story was like a really special moment to see like what the marathon can mean for people. That's great. That's great. Mark, how about for, for yourself? Um, easy one for me, TK. I'm a huge Meb Kaflesky fan, and Meb's win in 2014 was uh, it, it brought chills on you know on the back of my neck. Um, you know, obviously 2014, after the events uh, the year before, um, there was a lot of emotion in 2014, and and for Meb to be the first uh, U.S. male winner in in about 30 years uh, coming down Boyson Street was was just fantastic, and I, and I think the crowd you know, just were enthralled by, by Meb's win that day. That's a, that's a good one. That's a good one. Gerald, uh, what about you? I, I feel like you and Jacob were leaning towards that 2014 race as well as your favorite. So you got to yeah, think, think fast. I, I think Coach stole that one from us. Uh, <laughs> but I think, I guess <laughs> another one uh, was, was Dez's uh, win too in, in, the, in the rain and the cold that, uh, that one year just uh, – as another just very inspiring uh, race, and I think just a reminder to to be tough and, and see a race through, um, you know, whenever possible. So, yeah, I guess I'll go ahead and double down on on Meb's uh, 2014 race. Uh, I was still in, still in college at the time, but you know, we added up uh, the TV in the locker room and stuff, and you know, to be able to watch that, uh, that was really that was really cool to see American uh, compete at the top level. So all the guys are watching it. Are you guys freaking out in the locker room? What's going on? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we had a pretty good, pretty nice uh, locker room set up. So we get in there to watch, you know, watch races or, uh, you know, kind of whatever was big event was going on. So it was, it was really cool to, you know, share that with like my roommates and teammates and uh, just a bunch of people who were, you know, really pumped to see, see an American man coming down, coming down Boylston Street in the lead. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wayne, you've run uh, Boston, I think, 12 or 13 times. You said, do you have, uh, it, it must be tough, but is there one memory that's your favorite from, from race weekend? Easy answer, 2014. Um, but for different reasons, no disrespect to Meb. Meb is my man. But um, Boston Strong, uh, I was there for 2013. And then just seeing how the city came together in 2014 and all the runners and, and the support the crowd support that we got along the way from start to finish. Um, you could feel the emotion. I mean, that was just unparalleled. I don't know if we'll ever have another Boston Marathon like that. So for me, that uh, stands out as definitely my most memorable Boston Marathon. And Elena, how about for, for you with that sh iron shoulder that you've had of holding up the phone the whole time? You've done a great job. What's your favorite Boston Marathon memory? It's definitely Des winning as well. Um, I remember that day so clearly because in the six years that I've lived here, that was by far the most horrendous conditions, um, weather conditions in Boston. So I, 
it was it was awesome seeing her fight through that especially since she wasn't super confident coming into the race and didn't have the most perfect build up um so for her to win and those 30,000 people to finish that race in those conditions was super inspiring well well said and um that, that pretty much wraps us up i want to thank uh, these very talented athletes from the BAA High Performance Team. You got to check out Team BAA on, on social media and online. Um, but a big thank you to Erica Kemp, Elena Tab, Gerald Mock, Jacob Thompson, Director of Athletic Programs, Wayne Levy, and Head Coach Mark Carroll for joining us today to provide a little guidance and some suggestions for everyone getting ready to take on their own virtual marathon. Everybody, thank you very much. All right. Thank you, TK. Have fun. Thank you. Good luck. Good, Good luck. luck. Have fun. Yeah. Bye. Thanks, TK.